Well, because of the way I got into this, um, you know, and learning how to stretch small amounts of money a long way, which I had to do even more when I moved to San Francisco, just a kid chasing a dream like the Beats and the Summer of Love people did before me. In those days, it was like I was trying to keep up with all the punk releases that are now, you know, only dot-com jerks can afford them on eBay or something like that. But I was trying to grab those as much as I could so I could play them and whatnot and listen to it because I was trying to figure out how to make my own songs at the same time. But there was very little extra money. But say, you know, oh my God, we made five bucks at the gig. I could spend it on speed or spend it on coke or spend it on records. So the choice was obvious. You can play a record and bounce off the walls and get an adrenaline high again and again and again if it's a good record. You put a line of dope on a turntable, it's gone, done. And I noticed some of my friends were starting to go senile at age 21. So sorry, Tipper Gore, but music is not leading people to drugs. It leads people away from drugs. Yo, you're watching Crate Diggers, and whether you like it or not, you also now have to watch me. Jello Biafra, the guy behind Dead Kennedys, and all the spoken word, and the troublemaking, and all that good stuff. First guy put on trial for an obscene album in American history. Yeah, I ran for mayor, I got my name dropped to the hat for president of the 2000 election. Lard is my project with the ministry guys. I've done stuff with DOA and the Melvins, Mojo Nixon, no means no. And now I'm rocking the world with my new band, which, God, can I do some product placement here? I can. Yes, Jello Biafra and the Guantanamo School of Medicine. On vinyl, everybody, complete with this lovely picture, White People and the Damage Done. You know, never waste an album title on something people are, it isn't gonna like annoy people or stick in their head. Oh yeah, the Mrs. Miller psychedelic album with hash brownies on the front, where her voice was so horrible that she had a hit single on rock stations. She covered Petula Clark's Downtown. When you were lonely, you had to let it through, let it through, downtown. And here she is doing Green Camberine, a song called Renaissance of Smut. Tiptoe through the tulips, the roach. How can you go wrong with her little green hash brownies and everything? I was first exposed to rock and roll when my parents or my dad were trying to get me to go to sleep. I was seven years old. I might have already started second grade. And they blundered on a rock station, K-I-M-N in Denver. And uh, I was hooked like that. And there was a TV show on primetime once a week called Hullabaloo that apparently came out on DVD years ago, but I never got the DVDs. But uh, that was when it first occurred to me, oh, this is what I want to do. This is so cool. I and mean, of course, I didn't know it was lip synced at the time, but the frustration with exposure only to radio, though, was I had to listen through to all these songs that I hated that were just horrible. The pop croony ones, the kind of stuff that maybe would be American Idol music now or whatever. I'd rather listen to a jackhammer outside my window than that, even when I'm trying to sleep. But uh, so as I got older, I still gravitated towards the hard stuff. Born to be Wild by Steppenwolf comes out. Yeah, I'm there. Then came Led Zeppelin. They got on the radio. Black Sabbath Paranoid. Yes, yes, yes. Why do I have to wait through 45 minutes of the Eagles and the wannabe Eagles? Because Colorado was a national testing ground for that species of horrible band. My parents held off letting me have a record player and said, no, you can't buy records and play them in the living room. We only have a mono stereo and all the records are made in stereo now. You'll just have to wait. Nice excuse. Finally, it caved in in eighth grade. Got a little record player for Christmas and the first album was Creedence Clearwater Revival. I think it was a Pendulum album, not their finest hour, but they knew I really liked Creedence Clearwater Revival. 
and Steppenwolf II. Again, not their finest hour, but I probably played those records over and over and over again more than any I ever got since, including the Stooges, because it was the only records I had. And then eventually I saved up enough money to go to the record store and got the Woodstock soundtrack, you know, lots of different songs I liked, played live, and I got Led Zeppelin II and Led Zeppelin III. And then, a little bit late, I guess, yeah, maybe ninth grade or so, was uh, there was this ad on FM radio for the Blue Oyster Cult. And just a tiny snippet of music, like, ooh, what's that? Oh, and it's on sale at Budget Tapes and Records for $2.89 instead of 5 bucks. And when every penny of your dime actually counted for something, especially when you hardly got any allowance money, okay, I'm going to try this. So that was Tyranny and Mutation. And... You know, the cover was cool. I thought, okay, on a hunch, I'm taking this home just in case it's really good. And after a couple listens, I realized it was really good and great and got all my friends into it. And I think it was at that point I abandoned radio altogether and just started buying my albums on hunches. You were so sheltered in whatever upbringing you had before I got you, I don't think you'd do well if you lived outdoors and went out all the time. I can't remember how he came into my life, but eventually this album found its way into my house in the early 80s. I put it on and realized it was maybe some of the most frighteningly hideous music I'd ever heard, but fascinatingly so. ABBA level sense around productions, you want a saw noise, you want a children's choir, you want hula guitars, it's all there. You know, German Schlager oompa music and a real baritone voice, although he's got a multi-octave range and a strong falsetto he'll hit from time to time too. And I guess, um, you know, here's the one with a Hawaiian song on it. Hula, 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 la, 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 boing, with a timpani. The, 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 there's a rare one without the shades, too, where he looks like that guy James Bond had to put away in From Russia With Love. He had kind of a Tom Jones macho thing going, where supposedly people threw their underwear at him and this, that, and the other. There he is with some poodles. And there he is with psychedelic poodles on the back. <laughs> And uh, there he is with his leather jacket sitting near the fake sunset in the background. I guess this is all actually Prussian nationalist songs. Nosferatu, Heino. Heino in space. And more poodles. And then the one that takes the cake that's in the book. Liebe Mutter the Mother's Day record, where he looks like this, you know, you can fill it out and give, give it to your mom and everything. And then here's this grown-up version of the children from the village of the damned about ready to hand you an exploding bouquet or something. I mean, there's something just so dark with all this Heino music, too. And I realized it was so irritating that this druggy girlfriend of a roommate then would leave the house every time I put him on. Only Hino and Venom would get her to leave. And so I realized it's power. So for the next three years, instead of, you know, yet playing the Clash again or the Pistols or whatever before Dead Kennedys goes on, why not do the most punk thing you can and annoy everyone in the room and force them to listen to at least 30 minutes of Hino before we go on? We did that for years. <laughs> I found out about Trade to Tape and Records. It was a used record store a couple blocks from my high school. So sophomore year, I just ride my bike there after school and take every record that was in the free box, no matter what it was, just to see what it was. And plus, you know, there was Kick Out the Jams for 50 cents, which totally changed my life. It made me that much lonelier because my other friends got into Emerson, Lake, and Palmer and Yes at the same time. And to me, Yes is still maybe the worst band ever. 
You know, there's that, like the bottom six of just horribleness. And yes is at the very bottom. You know, yes, the Grateful Dead, the Eagles, the Bee Gees, the Beach Boys, although I respect Brian Wilson and all that. And most of that stuff, except Good Vibration, I can't stand. At least they had one good song. And the Four Seasons. I had to add a sixth one because they were just so f***ing hideous. Kick out the jams led me to the Stooges. And I'd wondered, who is this guy on the cover of Raw Power? I, they, like, I was not into glam or eyeshadow, but this, what if this is good? And then finally the first album turned up in a 50, same 50 cent bin. And then another Denver Post writer with better taste named G. Brown dumped his record collection, a trade of tape, or a large part of it. And so the only way they could turn it over was to sell everything for a dime a piece. And there was Funhouse sealed for a dime. And I also took out things I'd never heard of out of there, like all three albums by The Deviants, who I turned out to really like from uh, kind of the British closest thing to the Velvet Underground or something like that. And oh, I'm spacing on some of the others, but that was another life-changing event, and I ran out of dimes, so I had to quick ride my bike to another record store and sell off a copy of West Side Story I'd found at a thrift store and make another buck and ride back. And, but uh, that's what people do. I mean, the, 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 what, what, the, what taking all those free records did for me was it, it kind of widened my musical taste some, and though there were some magic accidents, not just with rock, but okay, this is kind of singer songwritery, but this person's good and stuff. This per I kind of like this person and stuff, so it kind of helped widen me that way, but because it was such a country rock and Scientology jazz fusion hellhole of a town, all over 21 adults, so there wasn't any really teenage underground live rock venues, that, you know, what else is in that bin, but I got all the Doors albums in the first six weeks, 13th floor elevators, this looks interesting. Naz, this looks interesting. Ema Sumac, oh yeah, my Spanish teacher played this in class and I thought she sounded like Robert Plant. I'll take this home too. Oh, produced by Les Baxter and sure enough a Baxter album turned up in there. And I thought the one that that particular one, the Sacred Idol, kind of had a little bit of Carl Orff in it. So that was what led me early on into Exotica before I even knew what it was. Then we get to the Exotica records, which also kind of uh, double as the sex records, too. <laughs> but uh, there you go, Tito Puente. I like his friend there. And uh, <laughs> you had to do something to add some sex into the packaging to see what you could get away with. So a lot of those records, they went to town with stuff like that at the time. Yeah, you even... Even old uh, Cameo got into the act with those. And, uh, you know, the, after the Japanese music, I brought home a Greek record I really liked, and then that moved me to Middle Eastern music. And there's a really nice one of those, musically and, let's face it, visually too. <laughs> and that one came out of the Vacaville Salvation Army or Goodwill or something. That's a neat one. He's, he's in some film noir movies, too. 